So, I will call first uh, Mr. Faisal Sarieldis for his testimony. You have the floor. You can hear me. Yes, hello. Uh, first of all, I would like to relate my regards to all of you. My name is Faisal Sarieldis. In the year 2016, in Turkey, I was an MP from the HDP, People's Democratic Party, and I had to come to Europe. Since then, I have been residing in Europe. On my way here, I went through a serious shock and trauma because this happened in the 21st century. It's very recent and this can actually be termed a war crime or a crime against humanity. I was born in Jizre and I was elected as an MP from Jizre on the 14th December 2015 until 16th March 2016 for 79 days there was a curfew uh, process. So this was a curfew period. This was a very systematic process which was pre-planned premeditated and during those seven to nine days we had horrible experience people were burned collectively the city was burned to the ground it was destroyed hundreds of thousands of people had to go on exile so many crimes can be uh, used to describe that situation so i have been given 10 minutes within this period of 10 minutes i will try to do my best to make this understandable for you honestly i've been in europe for about five or six years i'm a bit angry i'm furious because now we have the so-called progressive world this is the hot spot of the so-called progressive civilized world but when it comes to a war crime that happens elsewhere in the world, we don't have a power or a political power who has the will to intervene in such a place where there were crimes against humanity. Because when you have a war crime, it's a crime against the whole humanity. And when you cannot prevent it, as we can see right now, it spreads throughout the world. These crimes spread throughout the world. So in this process that I mentioned, 288 people whose names we currently have were massacred. Most of them were women and children. Of course, there were also youngsters and people from different age groups. Thousands of people were injured. But first and foremost, 120,000 people inhabiting that sub-province went through an unforgettable trauma. They will never forget this because after the process that I mentioned finished, within the first couple of years, more than 15,000 people committed suicide in that sub-province. They are still under psychological treatment. They just couldn't overcome this trauma or they attempted suicide and they still couldn't uh, overcome this trauma. So on the 16th of December in 2015, the public officials in Jizre received this message. This was sent by the Minister of National Education of Turkey to the teachers and public servants. There were thousands of public servants in Jizre and the government asked them to leave this city. Can you imagine in a place of 120,000 people, the public officials were asked to leave the sub-province and we noticed that this was an attempt at a massacre. So there was a plan to commit a massacre and we immediately uh, communicated this to the public opinion because in Jizre, uh, we were chosen, our party was uh, had received 94.5% of all the votes in the previous election. So we were seen as a threat. And there was a process of non-conflict. So the conflict was interrupted during that period there was a truce and it enabled us uh, to uh, establish a culture of democracy and this gave us a good chance to have good bonds with the people but when the political will the, the political government lost their power they reinstated this concept uh, by integrating with the pro-state uh, actors so in the year 2014 uh, the undersecretary of public security 
and the chief of staff and the government had laid out a plan in 2014, and this plan was later disclosed. So one day before these acts happened in Jizre, this was already, this had already become public in the news, and they had said that if necessary, 15,000 people could be killed and more than 200,000 people could be put in jail. And they were re referencing the events that happened in Sri Lanka in 2010. In 2010. So the report that I mentioned was published in the year 2019 in the state television of Egypt, and it consists of 45 pages and you can access this report it's open to public so this actually was a premeditated event so it has been confirmed there was also a document I will try to find it so in that document as you can see here all the soldiers so 10,000 soldiers and policemen who attended these operations had received special training and uh, they were told that they shouldn't be afraid of being brought to the justice or in front of public prosecutors. Uh, if there was a threat uh, perception, even if there are civilians around, uh, they could proceed with the destruction. And back then, this was already mentioned before the violence in Jizre happened, this was already disclosed and it was made public in the press. And then in the year 2019 in Egypt, uh, it turned out that this page was a part of this whole plan of destruction uh, that I mentioned, which was broadcast in the Egyptian TV in 2019. I would like to make it very quick because I have very short time. So this message was sent, this SMS was sent to the people, hundreds of thousands of people were living there. And then uh, some vans were carried into the sub-province, were, were used to, to carry m military artillery to the province. So this school started to be used as a station. Here you can see the vans which have military devices in them. Here you can see the state hospital in the sub-province. It was used as headquarters. You can see there were tanks and other armored police vehicles in its garden. And then throughout the city, as you can see, maybe you don't see it very well in the photos, but uh, you can see at a distance of 15 to 20 meters, there were armored vehicles stationed at that place. So you can see it better here. If I could magnify this picture a bit more, you could understand it better. But So this is the downtown of Jizre. It's located in a pit or in a basin, and it's surrounded by mountains. As you can see, there is smoke rising from the ground. There is a tank there. We also have the video of this. This tank uh, was used to hit downtown Jizre. There were 20,000 people inhabiting in this area. So. Every day, two or three people were killed during this 79 days, and most of the people were asked to leave the city because people were insisting in remaining in Jizre, and that was a political attitude. But when they also lost power and water after the first 40 days, uh, and after seeing that there were many uh, casualties and injured people, a lot of them had to leave. There were a couple of youngsters, there were university students, there were also people from the civilian popular assembly, there were women, there were artists or people who were producing documentaries and people insisted in staying in Jizre. They said that this was a political attitude and they said they would stay there as a shield to prevent a potential massacre. And uh, they started to bomb uh, the city with tanks, as you can see, smoke rising from this ground, and this was the result of attacks with tanks. After a while, this is what happened, <coughs> dear colleagues. I had shared this on uh, 22 January 2016, I believe, and then a group of people called me. I was 150 or 200 meters from the uh, site that I mentioned, and there was an international silk road between us. It went through the downtown of the city. There were military st vehicles stationed there. We tried to go there, uh, but then they used machine guns against us. So two people lost, 15 or 20 people were injured. So we tried to save 40 people from there, but uh, we haven't uh, managed to save them all. We also have the videos, and you can see them later if you want. Then the chief commis commissioner of the United Nations, Mr. 
Al Hussein mentioned that this was a horrible thing. They even used the metaphor uh, to say apocalypse. This is an apocalypse. We need to immediately go there and perform an inspection. But Turkey rejected uh, the arrival of the UN uh, delegation, and nobody can still go there. So there was an increasing trend. And the government kept saying, uh, the following, after a while, the city was bombed down and people took refuge in the basements of the buildings and they were beaten up, they were subjected to machine gun fire, the injured people wanted to be taken to hospital, they said that this was their legal right. As for the legislations, we had connection with the TV, also we had connection, they had connections with us, we wanted to broadcast uh, their opinions live, but the political government headed by Erdogan had been saying with all the ministries, they say, this is disinformation, there are terrorists there, they need to be destroyed, uh, there is a conflict there, and the people who die are terrorists, that's what they were saying. At that time, I connected some people who were staying there in the basement, they didn't have smartphones because they had no electricity, they were only using some batteries to charge their simple phones, non-smartphones, and then they mentioned uh, these names, eight or nine of these people, such as Istanbul, Kesir, Mehmet, Yavuzaj, Ali Fırat Kalkan, all of them are university students. They went to Jizre to become human shields. These are people who were registered at the university at that year. We also have a person who is 13 years old, for example, at that time, Tahir Cicek. We also have a person who was 65 years old. And I immediately wrote down the list of these people saying that these are injured people. I shared the list with the government and with the press. I gave their address. And these are the people who are just exhausted but not injured. So I had this list. And for one week, these people were held there. The government told us the following. If you go there, they will say everything happened by the book. Everything happened by the law. So the ambulances were sent uh, some to some place. Uh, they were said this was actually a mise en scene. They, that this was that this was fake news. That's what the government tried to say. Um, but I'm trying to show you what the ambulances did. Did this was a gas station at the entrance of Jizre. So normally only patients should be carried in these ambulances. This belongs to the Ministry of Health. But behind this, you see, there is a fuel tank of four or five uh, tons, and it was filling in fields in order to carry fuel to the tanks that were burning the city to the ground. So from the beginning till the end, this was horrible. This was totally illegal, and these practices can be termed crime against humanity. And on the other hand, the, govern the government was exhibiting three or four ambulances, and they were claiming that they were helping the people. So let me explain to you my personal anecdote. On the 22nd of January, we were told that there were four or five injured people uh, in the neighborhood, and we immediately applied the ECA charge uh, with a precautionary measure application. We told them that these people had to immediately be taken to the hospital uh, for treatment, but the government didn't allow us. They said, this is a conflict zone, you cannot enter there. We went to those people. Uh, with, uh, so I was escorted by 30 or tw uh, 20 or 30 people. I went to that neighborhood, and there was a public servant who used to work at the municipality. There was also a university student, and there was also another person who was 55 years old, but they had died because they had lost a lot of blood. But in the meantime, there were also seven or eight people who were also injured. So we still have their records. And there is a cameraman who was always with me because he didn't have security of life. So with him, we went to a neighborhood and we took footage of everything because we knew that the government could have killed us and we knew the scale of the events. So they always mentioned that I was an MP who was trying to save the terrorists. There was a chauvinistic climate in Turkey. So once the government tells that about you, nobody believes you anymore. You are discredited. It's time. The time is over for your testimony, and you will have opportunity to more elaborate in answering questions from the judges. So thank you so far, but now I have to stop your testimony. Let me just uh, wrap it up in a few minutes, please, if you allow me. I believe that I was a bit slow. You have the opportunity in answering questions. So all of those people were burned there. They were burned in those basements. So this is a forensic scientist, Mrs. Shebnam, 
and there you can see they look at a skull. So this was a very young person of 11, 12 years old. I, I, there is still a lot I wanted to explain. I haven't had the chance to explain everything. I have to just in answering question. Thank you very much. Uh, now I will give the floor to the judges for any question. Judge uh, Bianco, you will be. Thank you, ma Madam President. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, you are referring to some appalling uh, situations. However, my question is direct. What is the relevance of your testimony to the, to the topic that we're discussing today, independence of the judiciary and access to justice. Do you have any kind of conclusion in that regard? Because that's the, the topic we are discussing. So, could you please repeat again? I missed the beginning of your question because my uh, interpretation equipment didn't work. The crux of my, of my question is, what is the relevance of your testimony for the topic that we are here to discuss today, mm -hmm. namely mm -hmm. the independence of the judiciary and access to justice? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you can yeah. underline this element, please. Yes, let me immediately respond. So, the perpetrators, so when, when the organizers of this event mentioned this to me, I immediately accepted this uh, invitation. I said that I would talk about the crimes against humanity that happened in Turkey, and I told the organizers that this was a topic of global relevance, and that's how I prepared my presentation. So you can say the following. Maybe I should put it this way. Uh, even though it's not fully related with this topic, uh, I just wanted to find a platform to talk about these things. We need to make a note of these events. These are his events of historical importance. Uh, so I don't know if my presentation hasn't been directly related to the particular topic or the headline of the session, but I believe that these are issues that we should all know about. So I also have a presentation. If you could give me five or six minutes, then I can finish my presentation, and I think it will be more clear. No, I could. Thank you very much for your testimony. I think we have heard what you have to say, and now we have to stop. Voilà. Can I just say one thing? We have this document that you are mentioning. We also have many other documents. Uh, perhaps uh, I wasn't here in order to fully comply with the format of the session, but I felt it a bit strange because everything we have been talking about here for the last uh, three or four days are very real and very important, but I'm talking about war crimes. I wish a couple of more minutes could have been allocated to discuss this. Now, I understand the format, of course. No. Time plan, yeah. no thank you very much. Uh, uh, Madam President, this was not at all my intention. I, I just wanted to add. I was willing to convey his question, and no, please, it's over. Okay? I would just like to wrap up. Please listen to me. I would just like you to know about uh, how I think of the situation. Probably, maybe it was something to do with the organization. I wish you great success. Thank you.